Really, I want to thank everyone for coming. I, I uh, at the risk of sounding like cliches, I don't know about any of you. I'm extremely inspired just to see the number, the number of people here. It, it's, it's a very moving, inspiring thing. I want to. I, I feel like I'm going to be doing a lot of this, but I want to thank Stuart Rosenthal and Aaron Shalom very, very much. Um, just for anyone who was at the symposium, which was at, at Stuart and Aaron's initiative, I mentioned how I was sure no one would come. I, I want to state for the record that I think I told Stuart about 10 times that we're not even going to have a minion for Mincha. So uh, and, and it turned out okay. So uh, I, I, really, I really want to thank the two of them very much. I really want to thank everyone. Uh, honestly, I can only I can only speak for myself. I think if if I would go home now, I would be very inspired uh, by just seeing the number of people here and uh, knowing the content of what we're going to talk about for the next hour or so. You might be better off going home now. <laughs> um, but thank you very much. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to sort of break up our discussion tonight into three sections. The goal is to get through Shimon Esrei over these six weeks. Uh, the first thing I'd like to speak about tonight is a little bit of a general introduction about Shimon Esrei, a little bit of, a, of a, some perspectives towards Shimon Esrei, both kind of philosophical and structural. Then I would like to discuss the second brach of Shimon Esrei. For those people who were able to attend the symposium, we've already spoke about the first brach of Shimon Esrei that was recorded. I'm sure people can find that from Stuart later on a way to, to get their hands on that. And then hopefully there'll be time I'd like to discuss at least briefly the third brach of Shemona Esrei. My hope is that after each section we'll kind of pause. If anyone have, have any questions to discuss, we might have to limit the questions, but I'm sure if people have thoughts, uh, we'll all benefit from them. I'm sure if people have questions, many other people were asking the same thing. And what I'm really sure of is it'll be terribly painful to listen to me for a full hour. <laughs> so this will be another benefit. Um, there's an interesting medrash, it's a medrash Tan Chuma, on Parshas Korach, Perak Yud Beis. And it cites a Pasuk from Navi, which at least part of the Pasuk says, Kol Tisa Avon Bekakto, that we turn to God and we ask Him to bear our sins and take our good. Take our good instead of our sins, and will bring, instead of our calves, as korbanos, as offerings, will bring our own lips, will bring our own thoughts. And the Medrash says a very frequently quoted concept that there was a great way to relate to God in the base of Mikdash of the Temple through the bringing of Korbanos, to the bringing of sacrifices. Now, it's, it's difficult for us to even relate to why that would bring this great sense of, of connection. It's a, it's a great discussion what the connection would be. We don't have Korbanos today. It's, it's very difficult to even relate to it. But one of the famous approaches in the Rishonim as to what the meaning of a Korban is, is that a person is saying to God, I bring this animal to you, this animal I'm completely giving over to you, and that, that represents me. So everything about me is really yours. Everything that I have, everything that I am is really yours. And that's the message of a korban. And we don't have korbanos today, but what we have is our prayers. And, and that, the basic point of the medrash, what it means that our tefillos are supposed to be like prayers. It's funny, I was discussing it in another shir last night. It's not so easy to connect to God through Korbanos. Forget the questions about what the significance of Korbanos is. Forget those questions. Famous verses from the Navi emphasize the fact that it's not so easy. What, you just think you bring a Korban and then you're, you're finished? What are you thinking when you bring the Korban? So that's really the message of bringing the Korban. So it, there's, a, there's a mitzvah doing a Korban. There's an imagery in bringing a Korban that we can connect to. But on a basic level, what we do in Tfilos is very similar to bringing a korban. And Rav Shimon Schwab discusses the fact that that's really what prayer in general is about, and specifically Shimon Esrei. Specifically Shimon Esrei is turning to God and saying to God, I am your korban. Everything that I am is devoted to you. That manifests itself in praise of God. That manifests itself in asking God for assistance in doing things further. That manifests itself in thanks to God. All of these things. And he, he has a fascinating concept. There's a famous idea that we juxtapose the bracha of the Al Yisrael, that we thank God for bringing us the redemption, to the beginning of Shmon Esrael. So there's this famous idea, right, right after the, uh, the, the Shacharis, we go straight from Ruchat Hashem to Al Yisrael and Shemon Esrei. There's this whole question in Halacha, are you even allowed to say Omein to Al Yisrael before it starts Shemon Esrei? It's such a big deal to juxtapose them. 
So he says the word used for God taking us out of Egypt is Geula. And that's his redemption. And that's the word we use in, in, in a bracha of Al Yisrael, that he redeemed Al Yisrael. And the point that the Shrab suggests about that is it's more than he freed us, it's more than he liberated us. But Geula is a language of great closeness. That he, he redeemed us, he took us as his own. So actually that language of Ga'al Yisrael is the strongest expression of God's love for B'nai Yisrael. And then from there we go into Shemona Esrei in which we refer to ourselves as Korbanos to God. And that's the strongest expression of our love for him. So we try to juxtapose Ga'ula to Tefillah. Rav Schwab says that if we're to think of ourselves as a Korban Ola, Korban Ola is when the animal is completely brought to God. Some Korbanos person eats part of the animal. Uh, this might be difficult for some people to relate to, but there actually were services in the Beis Mikdash that didn't involve people eating at the end. It's a fascinating thing that there was some aspects of Judaism that don't involve eating food. <laughs> but the Korban Ola is when the Korban is brought completely to God. There were three basic components. There was laying the animal up. There was skinning the animal, there was cutting the animal into small pieces, and then there was burning the animal on the altar. And Rav Schwab suggests that if we are to think of Shmona Esrei as bringing ourselves as a korban, we need to relate to each of those three components. So one is what it is to skin the animal in the context of ourselves, is to try to view things sort of from our spiritual essence more than from our physical essence. Just to give as a muscle of that for a moment. He doesn't say this, but, but this is how it hits me. We all have times, whether it be in shouldering, davening, whether it be during some class, whether it be during a business meeting, where we find ourselves so not focused on what we're really there for and so distracted by mundane things. Right? Um, for example, let's say it was a little bit hot in a room, just theoretically speaking. Um, <laughs> it, 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 it might be, it becomes more and more, this is intended to help people strengthen in their service. Uh, it, it, it becomes difficult to focus on what we're there for because we become distracted so easily, right? How many times do we stand down in Shemona Esrei and all of a sudden something about a meeting that we have later in the day comes into our minds, right? Many people say they get the best ideas uh, during their prayers. Uh, that's not such a good thing necessarily. Uh, so the first point is the idea of skinning the animal is to try to remove our physical approach to this world during Shemot Esrei. And to try to, to, to peel off that skin of, of ourselves, so to say, and just relate to God and our spiritual essence. It's one aspect. The second aspect that he suggests is cutting into small pieces, cutting the animal into small pieces that can be a fascinating muscle for humility. There are sources in halacha that a person needs to humble themselves before prayer and just think of how lofty and great God is and, and, and how small we are in comparison to that. And just to put a little more of a positive spin on it, how fortunate we are. I mean, it's, 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 the, it's the most remarkable of things. How many times we, we live... Uh, where a uh, stone's throw from D.C., how many times, do, whether it be one of us, one of our friends, or someone visiting from out of town, will tell us, I'm going to an event, and I'm going to speak to the president for a minute. Uh, it's a big deal. What should I say? I'm going to speak to the president, the leader of the free world, for a minute. What can I say? Something cute, something meaningful, so what should I do? I speak to the master of the universe three times a day for however long we have time for, however long we decide to focus on it. And let's we even reflect on that. So the, the I'm, I'm, I'm nothing is, is, is very nice from a humility perspective, but we normally have a difficult way relating to that type of thought in our day and age. But how fortunate I am, how great the master of the universe is, how powerful he is. And here it is, he's interested in what I have to say. He's interested in what's on my mind. I mean, obviously we'll talk about this later in the series. We could put in our personal requests during Shmona Esrei. And, and we believe that he's listening. What a humbling thought. What, what an opportunity. What a humbling thought also. And then finally, the third thing is we take the, these, the skin the animal that we cut into small pieces and we burn it on, on the altar. And the image of flame. 
And what he suggests there is it's really about approaching prayer with passion. And that, that, that's an interesting thing. So again, these are kind of like his, his three bullet points uh, for what it is to approach prayer as a korban. One is this idea of, of ridding ourselves of, of, of the physical things that distract us. One is thinking in a more humble way about things. And the other is trying to approach it with passion. And um, the passion can really manifest itself in one of two ways. Hopefully, people will have different ideas kind of sprout up in, in, in our minds as we go through Shon Esrei. Um, for some aspects of Shon Esrei, the passion could be that we really believe that God can help us in a way, and we want that help. This, I'm, I've said it many times before, but it's been at least two weeks, so I'm going to say it again. Uh, there's a very powerful story told by Rabbi Yaakov Weinberg, Zephyr uh, Mavracha, that his son, and I, I, I heard his son tell the story. His son was an adult and was suffering from a very, very serious illness, and uh, his parents, Rabbi Weinberg and his wife, were visiting his son and family, and his son was resting in his bedroom upstairs, and he woke up to hearing his father, a distinguished Russian Shiva, screaming, I want a lollipop. And he was very disturbed. What in the world is going on downstairs? Am I hallucinating? What, what's going on? So the, the, the ill son's wife ultimately came up to see how he was doing. He said, what's my father talking about downstairs? And she told him that your father's trying to explain to me how I need to pray for your recovery that I should imagine, how is a child when they want a lollipop? You know, so, okay, the parent comes and very calmly asks the child for a lollipop, and, uh, and I'm sorry, the child, I would like a lollipop sometimes for my child, I haven't had one yet, but uh, the child comes and asks the parent for a lollipop, and the parent says no. So what happens at that moment? The child kind of shrugs his shoulders and goes back and says, okay, I guess, I guess I'll ask again tomorrow. <laughs> They ask again and again, and for each no, that only increases the passion. So if a person, if a person really believes that, it, it could be reactive to having a bit of problem in our lives, it could be proactive. If a person really believes that our health or our success or our happiness or, or, or world matters, national matters, community matters, if we really believe that they can be in God's hands, so it follows that we should approach it with great passion. But then, the other aspect of the passion, and I think that really speaks to the beautiful attendance tonight, is that prayer is a way to come close to God. Prayer is a way to connect with God. And I think my guess is if we were to go around the room, don't worry, we're not going to, but if we were going around the room and ask people, why would you take time out of, 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 of a, probably a long day and a ready you know, to, to, to just relax tonight, why would you take time out to come to a shir about tefillah? My guess is because we recognize that it's something that we put a lot of time into. And we intuitively sense it should be more meaningful in our lives than it is. And that intuitive sense stems from a feeling of passion towards God. We just have a little bit of difficulty plugging into that sometimes. But, but I think actually, I think it's fair to say, many of us find prayer very frustrating. And I think one of the greatest frustrations in prayer, sometimes the chazan isn't too good and that's its own frustration, but I think the greatest frustration in prayer is that I believe intuitively we understand it should be much more meaningful for us than it is. And I think that's the feeling of the frustration. And it's, on the one hand, it's somewhat of a daunting task, um, but on the other hand, every everything we do makes it more meaningful for ourselves. And. Uh, I don't think the goal should be by the end of this series or whatever else a person is doing in their lives to make it that every Shimon Esrei is a perfect experience now. But for everything, for everything that we do just a little bit better, it, it changes things. And then I, I think if we can grab onto some concepts or thoughts that will make things more meaningful for us, that would be a, a great thing to attain. Okay, um, one or two more things and then I'll, I'll open the floor for a few minutes. So, the final section of Monastery is more thanks for what we have in our lives. And we'll obviously we'll talk about that much more when we, when we get there, God willing. Um, the Gemara in Brachos, Daflam and Beis and Aleph explains that we learn from Moshe Rabbeinu this, this order, at least the first two sections. Parshas Vois Kanan begins where Moshe explains to Cloud Israel that he asked God one more time for this opportunity to go into the land of Israel. And if you look at the beginning of Moshe says to Hashem, 
you have begun to show me your, your greatness, your strong hand, you do all these wondrous things. And then the next pasuk is, please let me go into Israel. So the, so the Gemara says, you see that Moshe began with praise, and then once he praises God, he moves on to his request. And that's what we're doing. Every time we dash one ice at least during the weekday, certainly, the first section is we praise God, and then we move on to uh, specific requests. So this is kind of like a general introduction for Shmona Asrei. We could spend six weeks talking about general things. The goal is to give people snippets, and then after six weeks, people feel they have snippets on at least the whole thing. So I don't know if anyone has any comments or questions. Well, just, just a few minutes, so I, I apologize ahead of time if I have to not recognize someone who would like to say something. Anyone have a comment or question before we go on? Yes? What a tremendous question. I, I want to thank you very much. What a great question. Um, the, um, and I would have said that even if your mother wasn't here. I just want to say that. <laughs> um, but um, the question is, if we're supposed to focus on our spirituality, so if, when you start flipping through the middle of the Shonesri, there's all these very physical questions. So, you know, we ask God to uh, help me with my financial needs. Uh, God, uh, you know, uh, that the, the agriculture should go well. Uh, uh, this one, e even person should get better. That's somewhat physical. Um, a very, very valid point. I, I would answer two very different ways. Um, the, the loftiest answer, which I wish I was there, but, but maybe, I bet there are people in this room who are there, is that if a person really sees the world really through very spiritual lenses, that all of these things really are spiritual requests. In other words, God, I only want money to do mitzvahs. I only want money so I can give it stuck. I only want money so I can provide for the needs of my family, which I'm, if I'm thinking about in the right way, that's certainly a mitzvah, um, you know, and so on and so forth. So please help me, give me the tools to, to do what I need to do. Um, give me wisdom. Uh, give me good health. One thing related to that, if, if I'm asking for myself, for very physical type things, that's one thing. But if I see someone else's physical needs, even if I'm asking for physical things, I think that's an extremely spiritual thing to be concerned with someone else's physical needs, if that, that, if that makes sense. That's kind of one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it, uh, forgive me, I'm gonna repeat a story that I told very recently, but I just think it's, it's apropos. Um, try to say it briefly, I, I once had a, a student in high school and uh, this, this young man had been through very tough times. And uh, he and God didn't see eye to eye, at least not from his vantage point. And he really didn't doubt it. Like, he really didn't doubt it. He just sat there, and if, if the rabbis didn't stop him, he would put his head down, or whatever. But we didn't make him doubt it at all. He just sat there. Um, so we, I was once talking with my class about prayer, and he raises his hand, and he says, my <coughs> When my team has a, bas has a baseball game, I dive into God that it shouldn't rain that day. Is that wrong? Like, is that, is that like inappropriate to ask God that my baseball game shouldn't be rained out? And I told him, I think that's beautiful. Because more than anything, and this we'll talk about in many different ways, feel is about cultivating a relationship with God. So what HaKadosh Baruch really wants is whatever is important to us, we talk to him about. Now, it will be all the more meaningful for us if we can have a meaningful discussion with God from a spiritual vantage point. But if we're not there, so it's a fascinating comment about Judaism in general, by the way. That it, it's like the four sons, the four sons from the Haggadah, right? That it's like the Torah gives all these different approaches to how to connect the child to the experience of the Exodus. Because God's interested in all of us, wherever we are on that ladder, right? So we all need something to connect to, if that, if that makes sense. So I, it's a very valid point. Thank you for raising it. If there's any other, maybe just we'll take one more. Yes? Maybe you're going to address this later, but if the method that's been chosen is to say the same words over and over again every single day, doesn't that automatically make it more difficult to focus and to, to concentrate? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, just to repeat the question, a uh, very fair one. Um, you know what, your wife's here. That's a very good question. <laughs> uh, but but, uh, uh, but uh, a very fair question. 
wouldn't we find prayer more meaningful if it wasn't always the same text? I, mean, I think that's basically the point. Um, it's a very fair point. If I could say two things to that. One is, we're told that the Anshe Knesset, all of the, the men of the Great Assembly, were the ones who formulated the words of the prayer. And presumably there's great, hopefully we'll, we'll touch on it to a certain extent over these weeks, there's great wisdom in the specific words. Um, the other, another thing I just want to share is uh, there's a very interesting story told about Rabbi Noah Weinberg, Zikron of Racha, who was the founder and head of Eish Torah, the famous outreach of Shiva in Jerusalem. And he had some students who were beginning to get involved in prayer, and they came to him and they said, we find the sitter to be extremely restrictive. You know, and so we want to do things differently. <coughs> so, you know, when, when people are sort of starting off, we, we're, we're a little more loose, I think. So he said, you know what, great. Why don't you go try it for uh, whatever he told them, a week, two weeks. Just pray, just tell God whatever's on your mind. And uh, they appreciated the opportunity, and they went. And for two weeks, their document was, they just spoke to God about whatever was on their mind. And then he sat down with them after two weeks, and he asked them, how'd you find the experience? And they said it was very meaningful. It was wonderful. He said, great, if you don't mind asking, what did you ask for? So this one said he asked that all the sick people should be well, and that one asked for world peace, and that one asked for someone should do well financially, and so on and so forth. And he looked around, and he said, so it's not important to you that the Messiah come, that the third temple doesn't mean anything to you, and, and uh, you, you know, you, you, you pray that someone should get better, but you know, you don't, you don't think that your livelihood comes from God and, you know, and, and financial success and, and so on and so forth. And he kind of peppered them all with questions and they all were kind of scratching their head. And they said, you're, you're right, we should have done for more. But how can you expect us to, to know all these things we're supposed to daven for? You're very smart, we're not so smart. So he had them a sitter, he said, look inside, it's all there. <laughs> so so I, I, I think, um, it, in a sense, I agree with you that it's a great challenge to make prayer meaningful for ourselves. It's the same words again and again. Um, having said that, I think if we use the sitter as an outline, it is a detailed outline, and we say the words, but it actually is a little bit of a compass for ourselves on, on what to focus on. Um, I think that's beneficial. Um, I, if I can mention, I used to encourage my students in high school to do this. I wish I did it more. Uh, it, uh, this maybe we'll, we'll touch on more down the road, but the, the brothos in the middle of Shemona Esrei, they're all talking about different things. We'll be able to, to make lists for ourselves of people, whether in our own lives or the people we know, of all different aspects that fit into this bracha that maybe are not the literal meaning, but maybe it's something that can reflect on. And we can say the same words and rotate things to think about that for ourselves we can make it meaningful in, in, in that way. Um, and I think the final thing is that much of prayer is not necessarily us just telling God what's on our minds, but much of prayer is hopefully us gaining a closer relationship with God through reflecting on these points. And I think that's part of the wisdom of prayer. And, and I think that comes out from saying the same text. It's challenging. But if we are able to reflect on it, it does affect us, I believe so. I have to apologize. I think maybe we'll move on now. So if people want to follow along in this sitter, at this point we're going to... Skip the first bracha. Uh, again, it's, it's on record, but uh, but just before we go specifically to the second bracha, beginning with the words Atagibur, right after Baruch Atosha Magin Abraham, just to put things in context. So the first bracha is titled Avo. It's, it's about the, the forefathers. And what it's really about is it's really, it, there are some general statements of God's greatness. But what it's really about is this is really the opener to Shemona Esri, the opener to our conversation with God. And it's about the fact that we recognize that he had a very meaningful relationship with the earlier generations of our people, and we would like to access that meaning. And, and we believe he's Elokeinu, he's our God, the Elokeinu Sein, and the God of our fathers. And, and we believe that our ability to have meaningful prayer is innately within us. We, we, we firmly believe that. And it's a fascinating thing to reflect on. 
as we begin to continue with the rest of, of our, of our tefillah. Now we get to the second bracha. And the second bracha is all about, it's titled Gvuros. It's all about the strength, the might of God. There's a fascinating Gemara in Masechus Tanis, Da'afes Aleph. And the Gemara says there are three things that the keys to these things are only in the hands of God. What this Gemara means is very difficult to understand. Nothing is given over these things. It's not given over to the angels. It's only for God to control. What does that mean exactly? What about the other things? Does God not have exclusive control of the other things? If anyone's curious, we'll have week seven for that one. But uh, let's stay sort of stay focused. But but the Gemara says the three things are rain. Rain is so basic uh, to any society that's dependent on agriculture. Uh, rain is without rain, basic basic food we wouldn't have. Um, the ability to bear children and the revival of the dead. Those three things are absolutely in God's hand. And it's interesting, the Gemara says, the Gemara asks a little later in the discussion, well, what about parnasa? What about financial well-being? And the Gemara says that's included in rain. But it's interesting, a number of the Mepharshim point out that mafteach, mafteach is the word for a key, right? So we said there's three things that the keys are only in God's hands. Mafteach stands for um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm blanking out. I feel like Rick Perry. Forgive the political <laughs> reference. I'm sorry, sorry. That didn't mean anything political by that. But uh, um, um, the, 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 well, my, yeah, it stands for key, but, but pay. No, 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 no. Pay is parnasa. Pay is parnasa. Tough is tchias uh, hamesim, the revival of the dead. Ches is chia, childbirth. And, and I guess mem is, yeah, to be morid geshem, excuse me, to, to, bring down, uh, to bring down the rain. Okay, I feel better than Rick Perry. Uh, to, bring, to, to, bring down, to bring down the rain. So that, that, that spells out mafteach, that these are the, the, the four basic things. And in this bracha, there, we talk about the fact that HaKadosh Baruch Hu exhibits this great might over the world. We very much refer to rain. Which is the praise of God in the rain season said here. We certainly refer to the revival of the dead. We're going to see that according to some commentators, we refer to childbirth also in this. And as we said, Parnasa financial well being is connected to rain. So the point is that we touch on these things. These are considered to be unique aspects of God's might in this world. It's a fascinating coupling. Rain is something we can absolutely relate to, right? We understand. We understand how important it is. And yet, the fact that we understand how important it is makes it a little bit less impressive in our minds, because it's masim shebechol yom. We have it all the time. Tchias hamesim, the revival of the dead, is something that we have no idea what in the world it's about. But be, almost because we have no idea what in the world it's about, it's we see it as so unique and so amazing. The Gemara says that rain, in a sense, is more impressive than the revival of the dead. And the Gemara, I mean, I mean, if you think about rain as a miracle, that God is constantly bringing something that's bringing ability and strength to the world, and the Gemara says, Tchiesa Mason, the revival of the dead, it's a case-by-case -case basis. Not necessarily everyone is going to be revived. Maybe this one, yes, maybe that one, no. The only specific merits, rain, it's the whole world. So, it, I mean, obviously, one could go back and forth on this, but, but the point the Gemara makes is, in a, in a, at least in a certain respect, if we only looked at it in a, in, a, in a unique way, rain, in a sense, is even more special than the revival of the dead. But it's fascinating that the coupling of recognizing the strength and greatness of God is these two very different aspects. Okay. There's so much more said about the specific words than what I'm going to say here. This is kind of thoughts that hit me. Um, from a number of different commentators, uh, you could do a whole lot better than what I what I what I'm sharing here. I will say for those who are more comfortable with English, none of the commentators I'm going to cite are, are from Hebrew works. But I think I mentioned the symposium. There's a beautiful art school book based on the lectures of Rav Shimon Schwab on prayer. It's in English. It's great, 
And uh, I'm going to quote him a number of times here. It's extremely meaningful what he says, at least to me. And if you like what he says, uh, his writing on any of these sections is far more extensive than whatever snippets I'm quoting from him here. So if it speaks to you, I would encourage you uh, to look into the book. What's the name of the book? It's something like uh, On Prayer. It's, it's from Shimon Schwab from Art Scroll, but it's about prayer. It's about prayer. Rav Schwab on prayer. I knew it was a more flashy title. Yeah, okay. So, Atagibur Leolam Hashem. Just, just, yes, just a basic thing to think about for a moment. How powerful it is that we begin a bracha. This is not the only bracha, I just want to say like this. How powerful it is that we begin a bracha with the word Atag. You. So, God is great and mighty and all these things. And here we are, we're talking directly to God. It's, 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 it's an empowering thing to just think about. So, Rav Schwab points out that the first person in the Chumash to refer to God as the name Ado, you know, that we have in the, in the beginning of Atah Gibor, was Avraham Avinu. So there's a very powerful thing that the bracha that immediately follows the highlighting of God's relationship with the forefathers and that we continue that, the bracha that immediately follows that, right out of the box, we refer to God in the same way that Avraham Avinu. And this is considered to be a more personal reference to God than referring to him as Melech, King, or Adon, or Master. It's just an interesting thing to think about. Okay. Gibor, Rav Schwab says, Gibor doesn't only connote that God is mighty, Gibor also connotes that he's stronger than another force. There's a true Gibor, Right? It's not just someone who can define strength. What's the definition of strength? I don't know how much can you lift that you're considered strong. So on some level, there's always going to be a relativity in that definition of strength. Right? So if, I, if I'm more powerful than another force, then I'm Gibor. So you, God, are the ultimate Gibor because there's nothing stronger than you. So Schwab just points out, what is one, maybe the most powerful thing in the world that we can never fathom anything overpowering it? The power of death. And in this bracha, we talk about God's ability to revive the dead. So atah gibor, you are the ultimate in overpowering. And there's that everything is on your terms. Even the death that you bring into the world, when you decide to reverse that, you can reverse that too. And specifically, a number of professors point this out. We say atah gibor liolam. Your strength, your might is eternal. And that, of course, speaks to a person died. And God can bring them in, and God can make them live forever if he wants to. And it specifically speaks to this idea of eternity. It's an interesting thing. Atah gibor liolam Hashem, mechayei meisim atah, rav lo shia. You bring the dead back to life. You are abundant in your salvation. Now, Avudraham is, is, is one of the earliest commentaries on the Siddur. The Avudraham points out that in this bracha, we refer to God as Mechayei Meisim three times. Three times in this bracha, we refer to God as Mechayei Meisim. The first one, we just, we just, we'll, we'll flag the others as we go. He says, he suggests that each of the three times we refer to God as Mechayei Meisim, or Bible of the Dead, it's referring to a very different thing. The first time, we refer to God as Mechayei Meisim for every person who woke up that morning. It's a fascinating thing, particularly when you think about darkness. <coughs> To think about that. Here you are, you know, at the beginning of Shimon Esrei in the morning. The fact that I'm alive today, I consider that you brought me back to life. That's the first Mechayi they seem to be referring to. Maybe we'll, as we go, we'll refer to the others in, in context. Um, Sefer Haman Hagos says that, you know, we just said that God is mighty. We just said that God is mighty. So if I were to ask you what association do you have with the term might, might, it's gibor, war. Uh, Hashem ish, uh, you have in the, the Asiyashir, it talks about God as a, as a mighty warrior. It, it, it implies war. So the same time when says, what we mean when we say Mechayi Mason right afterwards, that you revive the dead, is there are all these people walking around the world who have been in battles, and if not for the grace of God, they'd be dead right now. And any one of these people walking around 
is the beneficiary of God's reviving of the dead. Not in the mystical way, but in the day-to-day -day way. Again, some of these things, some of some of these things might hit us in a very powerful way. Some of them might not hit us so much, but it's just an, another interesting thing to think about with Chaim Mason. Okay, um, Rav Loshia, the uh, God provides abundant salvation. The Rebbe Yarker says the greatest type of salvation we could have in this world is uh, the revival of the dead. But he also makes another comment. Just the image is so powerful. Think of the destruction of the city of stone. The famous story from the Chumash. When Lot and his family were living in stone and the angels go to save Lot and his family. And so around them there's complete, utter, total destruction. And some way, somehow, Lot and his daughters make it out. The Rebbe Yarker says that is an image when we talk about that God is abundant in his salvation, that's that ability. That, that there could be total chaos all around the person. At Lo Aleinu, we know, we can imagine stories of natural disasters and the forbid terrorist attacks. And this terrible story of, 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 of the church from this past week. So I don't know why the people who died died. And it's a, and every death is a tragedy. But why did some people die and some people survive? We don't know. We don't, we don't, we don't begin to know. Think, you think of the Shul and Hernov, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm sure not the only one who has the immediate uh, thought that I have to start the Shul and Hernov. How did some of these people survive? How in the world did they survive? Rav Loshia, one never knows. One never knows. And again, I, I don't mean in any way to take away from the terrible tragedy of the people who died. Uh, but, but we don't know. God has this great ability of salvation. Okay. Um, now, at, at certain times of the year, generally speaking, half, half of the year we say, Masha Baruch Mori Nageshem. This is not a request. This is a praise of God that we recognize the rains that he brings, and we see that as being a sign of God's strength. Um, the most basic reason why we see it as a sign of God's strength is what the Gemara said, I already mentioned it, that you know, we're impressed by the revival of the dead. We should really be impressed by rain, and that's also a great example of God's strength. But just, it's a fascinating thing to think about. The Avudraham says, just think, there's this droplet of rain that's coming down. There's wind. How in the world is that drop of rain going to get where God wants it to go? What are the chances? The answer is, it's the Kabur of Hashem. It's the strength of God. It's a fascinating muscle, muscle to think of. Imagine going up to a rooftop and, and trying to predict you're going to empty a cup of water on the rooftop. Try to predict where it's going to go. And it's stormy weather, by the way. And yet, Akash Baruch, whoever got it wants to rain, will rain. This is also, in a very simplistic way, somewhat. It's the Guru of Hashem. It's just a thing to think about. Okay. Let's keep on going. Mechalkiel Chayim Bechesed Mechayim Simbra Chayim Rabbim. So we, up until now, we were talking about a very lofty thing of revival of the dead, though we said the revival of the dead might just be waking up in the morning. But one type of thing, we made mention of rain, at least in certain times of the year we've been mentioned of rain. And now we say that God provides for, our, for, for life, generally the connotation of Bechal Kel has to do with Parmasa and things like that, uh, you know, financial well-being. God provides for our life with kindness, he revives the dead. This is the second mention of the revival of the dead. Barachamim Rabim, with abundant mercy. So first of all, the Avudram says the meaning of the second time it says revival of the dead is this refers to rainfall. This is, you know, we keep on talking about rainfall is impressive like the revival of the dead. The fact that the world and the agricultural world would just stop if not for, for rain. So every time it rains, God is giving that life again. That's what the Abu says. <laughs> okay, now, Rav Schwab he has a fascinating comment over here. Mechalkel. So I said Mechalkel connotes providing for financial needs. Why does Mechalkel connote providing for needs? What, what does Mechalkel mean? So a kalkala is a basket. Interesting, an interesting, interesting word to think about in this context. So, it's, so I guess on some level it's like God gives us the package that we need. Rav Schwab says it's really interesting. A basket is, by definition, a very limited thing. Right? I mean, you could bring me a large basket. It could be a full basket. 
But by definition, a basket has its limitations, right? There are walls of the basket. It only, it only holds so much. Ironically, if you would pour all the blessings of the world upon me, but you wouldn't give me any vessel by which to hold them, I wouldn't have them, right? So basket is very helpful. But that limiting is very helpful, but it is an inherently limiting thing. He says also the word vaychal. Vaychal means to complete. That's also related to mechalkim. So these words have a connotation of limitation. So he says, when it comes to our basic needs in this life, God provides it for us with kindness. But he doesn't provide us anything we could possibly need. He provides us with limitations. One person needs X amount of money. Another person needs 3X amount of money, and so on and so forth. God sits down, he figures out what we need, and he gives us what we need. Obviously, we have to do our end to get those blessings, but he gives us what we need. It's kindness, but it's, it's a controlled and, and somewhat measured kindness. That probably in its own right is kindness, right? Imagine if we had more than we needed. We'd be so distracted. I mean, I'd like to try sometimes, but... Okay. may sim v'rachamim rabim. But when it comes to revival of the dead, that is with abundant mercy. That's no limits whatsoever. This is an interesting shot just in the, in the word. Okay. Um, the Avudraham says that he's mechal kel chayim chesed. He provides for life with kindness and not at all because the people for whom he's providing necessarily deserve it. You know, a person, a person gets up in the morning, thank God, there's a roof over our heads, there's food on the table, there's air to breathe, there's water to drink, and we take that all as a given. Somebody, somebody once said to me that they have, that they have a friend who, who thinks we're really difficult in their lives. Whenever there's a conversation like that about the friend, I always wonder if it's really a friend or if it's the person themselves, but either way, it doesn't matter. They, they really have a, a lot of uh, difficulty and challenge in their lives, and they're having a very difficult time being thankful to God. And what would I recommend that they tell their friend uh, to give them a, a, a perspective? So I said, listen, I don't, I don't know, but I, I think it's essential for the person to see the blessings that they have in their life. So the person said, do they have no real blessings in their life? I said, well, I mean, are they alive? I mean, did they, did they have food that day? Did they, you know? And then the person said, yeah, but, but everybody has that. Now, now if, if we're really having a very candid conversation, that's an extremely fair response. And I think emotionally we can very much relate to that. But intellectually, we appreciate that that's not the right answer. And, and, and that's, that's what the Abu Traham says, we need to recognize that the basic life needs that we, thank God, that the vast, vast majority of us get day in, day out, it's a chesed of God. Are we so sure that we deserve it? Is, can we not see the chesed of God within that? Mechayim sim b'rachamim rabim. Doubling back a little bit. He revives the dead with abundant mercy. What's this abundant mercy? So we have one shot of this abundant mercy that it's you know, limitless, the kindness of a revival of the dead. The Ravon says, this refers, how could it be that there's a fetus within a woman's womb and this fetus develops the whole way and, and, and makes it and, and comes out into this world healthy and ready. That says the Ravon is what we're referring to in the Sim Rabbi. The abundant, abundant mercy that this, this, that this, that somehow God has this miracle that this baby came into the world. So if you remember, we said before that Mar says there are three keys. Mar says there's rain, there's the revival of the dead, and there's childbirth. So at least according to Ravon, this is the childbirth reference. So mech no flim, God supports those who have fallen. Virofecholim, God heals those who are sick. The Avudraham says, what does it mean God, God supports those who have fallen or rights those who have fallen? The Avudraham says sometimes a person's ill and the doctors give up hope. You know, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe, uh, I'm not necessarily talking about life or death, but, but the person has some, some illness, some disability, and the doctor says, there's no way it's ever going to get better. This is the injury. You, you can't heal this. 
we all, I think, can think of examples of people that we know or ourselves. You know, sometimes you were wrong. They make it. They make it and they flourish. So now Boutram says that's the pattern so make no flip. That people who have been written off as having fallen and won't be able to rise again, God picks them back up. Says the shot. Rofei he heals the, the ill. That, that Vudram says a similar concept, just one step further. There are times where patients are given up for death. That there's no hope whatsoever. And you know what? Sometimes they come back. Umatira surim. And he unbinds those who are bound up. Those who are unable to, to move. That could be in so many different ways. Now, this isn't from the before, I'm just talking. You could have physical disabilities, you could have emotional impediments in one's life, and people are just stuck and they can't. And, and sometimes, with, with great kindness, people are unbound. And he establishes his faith for those who are sleeping in the dirt. <coughs> Two shatim, and there's a lot of disagreement among commentators about this. What's this? He establishes his faith or, or his trustworthiness to those who are sleeping in the dirt. So one shot, the Rebbe Yarker says, this refers to the to the patriarchs, that it promised the patriarchs that he would give their descendants the land of Israel. So they are no longer living, but the day will come. Oh, we thank God, benefit in so many ways from the land of Israel now, but in terms of a full, full redemption, that day will come. And those people, those patriarchs who were residing in the dirt, that will be his opportunity to fulfill his promise to them. That's what the Rebbe Yorker says. By the way, he says specifically the language of dirt refers to Avram Avinu, who refers to himself humbly, Afar Va'efer, the ash and dirt. Just an interesting, interesting point. The other shot, which is what the Avudram says, which my guess is most people think this, the Avudram says that there are people lying in the dirt, buried, Numerous people that will ultimately be brought back to life. And God will prove himself by bringing those people back to life. That, I think, is this that we're coming to. Both, both understandings exist. It is interesting to think about the first shot that we said as sort of still being an outflow of the first bracha, of this whole, our relationship with God as an extension of the early generations of the Jewish people. It's interesting to think about in that light. Okay. Mi chamocha Baal Gvuros, who is like you? Baal means the master. The master of these strengths. It could be rain, it could be the revival of the dead. Like one shot, it could be the miracle of, of life. Who, who is remotely similar to you? Melech me mis you are the king that you do cause people to die, and yet you bring them back to life. You, like we said at the beginning of the bracha, you overpower your own force of death. Umatzmiach Yeshua, and you allow salvation to sprout forth. Rav Schwab suggests that this language of matzmiach, which is the language of sprouting and growing, could be a slow growth. So it's a remarkable thing to think about. Just imagine, and I'm not recommending we say it, but imagine standing at a funeral, and they just buried someone in the soil. And imagine sitting there and saying, we're now, going to, we're now, this is the beginning of the process of the person coming back. I mean, again, I'm not recommending one say it uh, at a funeral, but it's a powerful thing to think about. Rav Schwab says that's the point here. That even at the point of, of the greatest feeling of loss and at the lowest of lows, God's already turning, you know, turning it the other way, turning the wheel the other way. It's an interesting thing to think about. You are believable that you can bring the dead back to life. Blessed be you who bring the dead back to life. And the Abu Drum says this third time, they refer to the bringing the dead back to life. This is really bringing the dead back to life. Not getting up in the morning, not ready. This is, this is bringing the dead back to life. Um, Rav Schwab just points out so interesting that we refer to Mechayeh HaMesim. Mechayeh HaMesim is in the present tense. The one who brings the dead back to life. I wouldn't have said that. I would have said the one who will bring the dead back to life. 
haven't seen it. So one shot could be, of course, that there are many meanings of bringing the dead back to life. We're saying that when it rains, in some way, that's bringing the, the dead to life. But Rav Schwab says the reason why it says it in the present tense is it's an absolute statement of faith. That even though we've never seen it, we, it's, it's at, as far as we're concerned, it'd be happening right to our side. We, we, we absolutely believe in it. Um, it's late. On behalf of everyone, I want to thank Dr. Ron Scheinson for making sure I had a watch. Uh, it's, a very, it's a great kindness to all of you. I don't believe me. Um, maybe we'll take one, one or two comments. I don't know. Just going based on what you were saying about the present tense, I thought it was interesting that so many notes, and it doesn't say those who have fallen, but really those who have fallen, meaning that we're never at a point where we're actually down to the ground and we can't move anymore. Hashem is already there with us as we're going through it, and it's up to us to respond to that. I think that's a beautiful point. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, yes, Carol, last, last comment. Okay. Uh, do you have any insight into why it says me, Kamoka, who, who was, you know, great, thank you, as aim, why don't we make a, a statement that's more, there is no other aim. I don't know. I don't know. It's a fair. I'm sure there's a wonderful reason I'm not aware. Maybe the question is phrased out there in the shield. Yes, and, and, and that, that is a very good point. Many, many, many of the phrasings in the Shimona Esrei, thank you very much, many phrases in the Shimona Esrei, I really take off some, some good. And so, for example, that really I probably should have said that to you as a guess uh, without even knowing, but Mr. Hornesnay's point is very well taken. We have, uh, we have an Az Yashir, you know, uh, right, you know, who is like you. So it's, 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 it's a. Uh, yeah, I mean, I hear that, you know, there's also that special prayer that we say in the morning on Shabbos, Ain uh, Kelokainu. Right. Okay, so it starts off, first it says Ain, right. and then after it's established that there is not, nobody right. else like God, then it says Me Kelokainu. Right. You know, asking right. Right. who is I. I hear it. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, we'll we'll dive in Marvin in a couple of minutes. We'll just need to reset the room. But uh, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Thank you. <laughs>